Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India this particular lecture we talk about uh, some basic introduction of uh, atmosphere atmospheric flight mechanics there is nothing to do with uh, too much extensive detail i mean the, the, this is a course by itself we'll talk about many many details of that but i i assume that uh, many people who, who study this course may not be knowing anything about flight mechanics for them it becomes a small introduction of basic principle how things fly actually then later on we'll see some of the equations involved in that and how to manipulate that using control system theory that uh, that connection will build on later but this particular class we'll just uh, just see some uh, some basic principles of flight mechanics first of all there are various aircraft designs uh, uh, if you see first to fly probably goes to this particular gentleman uh, here his name is uh, otto uh, linenthal and he actually is the first person to make uh, repeated successful short flights actually so you kind of mimicking the bird sort of thing he attempted that actually and uh, essentially use a fixed wing glider and then uh, obviously died at uh, in a crash in 1896 and purposefully he knew that the, the risk involved and he kept on saying that uh, sacrifices must be made actually and that's a great sacrifice in fact actually so the first person to attempt flying uh, like a bird then the obviously we all know that the next uh, big credit goes to Wright brothers okay and they, they started as glider and glider engineers and later on pilots as well and they did lot of internal testing followed by optimization and things like that uh, of the wing structure and things like that uh, however the uh, the most credit for this Wright brothers successful flight goes to the control surface actually that means they they are the first persons to realize that uncontrolled flights are simply not possible they you need to have a control system for successful flight actually so that is that is the reason probably why they were successful where others were not that successful actually is also the first uh, engine power flight in 1903 just about a 100 years back 100 105 106 years back actually okay so within that the tremendous uh, improvement in this uh, this field remember just about 105 years back nobody knew how to fly actually they are all surface transport only but uh, air transport was just not there actually now after that you can will uh, can skip a, a gap of about uh, 30 years probably then we'll go a little bit uh, uh, to the modern era this is uh, something which people started uh, which is called as biplane you can see that there are two wings here one bottom one one top to uh, that essentially creates additional lift to support your structure actually okay at the expense of a little bit additional weight also by the way because the more structure you add to the system the weight becomes more as well actually it was it had high maneuverability it was very popular in the early days of aviation actually so i mean sometimes people even uh, use this for uh, for war applications in world war actually okay. then uh, there are uh, other applications there are other many 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 designs has come up uh, over the period of time the next thing probably you can see is uh, this is a very long wing okay essentially mimicking eagle flying okay if you have eagle flying i mean they they just we can constantly do that this is something called high aspect ratio that means uh, if the uh, the wing span is very long okay so it has uh, i mean it it has it's a very efficient wing in that sense actually okay however it cannot fly at low altitude and things like that it has to fly at a relatively high altitude and uh, and it has a low speed it, it can also take low payload actually okay so these are like various consideration point of view people will use many many different thing this is i mean uh, and this is just what i give here is just a small glimpse of things actually largely collected from internet okay so this part of it then coming to commercial aircraft uh, this is the the best possible aircraft available in market today okay commercial aircraft the airbus 380 okay the the strong competitor from that is boeing dreamliner which is being designed it's not yet in service but this is in service So, what are the aspects that you are looking for in commercial aircraft? You look for something like high lift uh, versus drag ratio. That is invariably there in all aircrafts, by the way. But the moment uh, your lift to drag ratio becomes uh, more and more, your efficiency of flying, efficiency of the aircraft design is higher actually. 
So, then in addition to that you also look for high fuel efficiency, high reliability and safety requirement. You carry so many passengers out here in a, in a regular basis. So, you cannot uh, compromise on safety issues and also remember these are all long flights as well actually. So, you really required good handling quality. So, that pilot can fly it uh, in a good way ok, whatever he expects the, pilot, the, the aircraft responds that way. And then it, there is a strong requirement for passenger comfort as well ok. Uh, so, the too much of vibration, uh, too much of oscillations are kind of not required out here actually. All weather operational capability is a requirement for, for airline operation, profit operations and all that ok. However, you remember the speed and agility or uh, what you known as, uh, what is known as maneuverability are not that critical out here actually ok. You can nicely take off, go land and as long as you uh, maintain safe uh, safety requirements and passenger comfort to good handling quality and things like that, then you are very much ok. And on top of that you have to assure that the aircraft design is very efficient with uh, good engine quality also like fuel efficiency has to be very good here. Then coming to the next class so this is a fighter aircraft, there is a slightly roll reversal out here. What you really require is high speed, high climbing rate, high maneuverability, stealthiness and things like that actually ok. So, here efficiency and uh, is not that much important actually, if I, if I require I can pay a little bit extra money for uh, for my comeback to superiority actually ok. So, I have to overpower the enemy, so for that I require all these actually. So, then these are typically characterized by characterized by very powerful engines, they are uh, short wings, high cord length, complex geometry, large control surface because you really require high maneuverability, I mean high ma uh, maneuverability that means high control actuation and things like that. High fuel consumption is also there and hence it, it has uh, some limited operating range as well. Remember it cannot carry heavy amount of fuel either basically ok. So, all these limits is operational range. So, there are there are concepts like uh, I mean uh, for refueling the aircraft to on the fly that means as, as it flies it can be refueled as well actually from a oil tanker and things like that actually ok. So, there is a com complete row reversal here compared to commercial aircraft to fighter aircraft. Commercial aircrafts are purposefully designed, designed to be very stable and uh, kind of robust application safety requirement things like that. Here it is purposely made unstable and control surface control uh, design makes sure that uh, you, you the I mean the closed loop system becomes stable, the open loop is really unstable actually here ok. Then there are uh, various other other designs, this is something called flying wing aircraft that means you can visualize the entire thing as a single wing. And these are all the requirements from stealthy considerations actually. It has high stealth capabilities so that is low visibility to radar, fuel efficient, uh, it is also fuel efficient due to low drag because typically it flies at very high altitude. So, the air density is very low, dynamic pressure is low, drag is low actually. We will see that uh, just a little a couple of slides later actually. And normally I mean th this is uh, typically not uh, very popular for commercial aircrafts because there is no window arrangement here. People do not like to sit in a kind of a blind hole. So, I mean uh, without looking outside they cannot uh, just uh, want to I mean they do not normally do not want to sit in a dark room sort of thing actually ok. So, that is not very popular among passengers actually. Now, coming to the conventional aircraft geometry, if you see the aircraft geometry there are various various uh, uh, parts of the aircraft that has specific requirements actually. It is a complex system of course. It has uh, first of all engines which is, which is required for propulsion. It has a huge fuselage sort of thing where people can sit, move around and things like that. Uh, that is that is where people sit. Uh, to wings here which are largely are responsible for generating lift and there are uh, there and then there are uh, uh, like the cockpit here where passenger I mean pilot seats and there are whole lot a whole lot of instrumentation out here ok. And after that there are a lot of control surface uh, arrangement actually ok. So, this is something called this particular thing is called vertical stabilizer, this is horizontal stabilizer the entire thing and then within that there will be like cutouts here which can actually deflect left and right actually ok that way. If you see this particular thing it can it can deflect uh, left and right, this particular thing it can deflect up and down and things like that actually ok. So, then there are uh, other arrangements like what is called a spoiler, slot and there are ailerons, so there are uh, like flaps out here and things like that. There is a huge number of control surface that goes on here essentially as uh, as part of uh, part of the wing or vertical or horizontal stabilizers and there will be cutouts which can actually move up and down or left and right actually ok. So, through that the, the control uh, moments get generated and how it how it is done we will see that actually here. 
coming to a different class uh, there is a tail less aircraft what you see here is a is a complete tail arrangement actually there is a horizontal stabilizer there is a vertical stabilizer out here but in this one this one there is no no such arrangement out here there is no wing see if you go there there is a clearly there is a big wing and there is a tail arrangement here both of things both of the things are kind of coupled out here actually they, they are put it put it together for uh, for various uh, various reasons and one of that is this this uh, typical aircrafts are typically supersonic so the shock wave will get generated and all that that should not hit the wing actually it should go outside the wing okay so the once the shock is generated here it will it will something we like this actually it will go outside the wing it will not touch it actually okay. anyway so that is uh, one reason of that there are other reasons as well actually okay. what happens here is the pitch control and roll controls that is typically done through the pitch control is done through elevator and roll control through ailerons that are done together out here what are called as elevons actually if they are differentiated uh, if, if they are reflected uh, uh, in a symmetric way they serve as ailerons if they are deflected in an asymmetric way that is one up and one down then they serve as ailerons as well actually so that's uh, that's the reason for what is called as aileron plus uh, elevator the elevator plus aileron that is elevons actually okay so th th there are variety variety of things another things uh, that is people have attempted is something called canard configuration that means instead of a, a wing i mean instead of a control surface at the back they want a control surface in the front actually that is something called canard structure okay so again inspired by some some fish uh, design and some uh, like some pieces have this structure actually how uh, how they control their movement and all that and some birds uh, also have this actually so what it what it essentially does there is a horizontal stabilizer and elevators are kept in front the advantage being better control characteristics what happens here is if you will see it later that if you have a if you have a elevator in the back that actually creates a downward force first if you really want to go up okay if you really want to go up this this needs to be i mean you need to create a force downwards so that this entire there is a moment upwards so the entire aircraft actually kind of rotates upwards and then it uh, it generates a lot of lift out here we'll see that mechanism couple of down uh, slides down the line however that means there is a force that creates that is created downwards first here to rotate the aircraft in a, in a positive sense actually okay so that means uh, then th this entire fell entire body of the aircraft essentially first goes down and then goes up that's that's the nature of what is called is uh, this uh, non minimum phase system actually so that is kind of avoided here because if you really want to go up you create a create a force up so that the if you create a force up up out here then there is a moment also upward actually so then there is no no moment of going down and then going up actually it simply starts going up and up and up actually okay so that is that you eliminate this uh, non minimum phase phase behavior characteristics actually however uh, a drawback actually it uh, the the flow out on the aircraft gets dist gets distorted actually because see if anything happens at the at the tail the actually air flow is from from front to back actually so anything that you do here the flow disturbance doesn't affect the body actually it the flow on the body but here it is not so it actually affects the flow on the body that means the aerodynamic modeling becomes difficult actually okay so there is that means your control characteristics will be good but you will be working with a model that 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 doesn't have good fidelity that means you again compromise on that aspect okay so so that is the so there are various uh, structures that are available these are this is only a simple uh, few glimpses out of that actually now coming to how this uh, i mean how this uh, objects fly in the air so let's uh, see that uh, basically there will be like force and moment balances actually okay let's study what is force balance first so any flying object in in a straight and level flight let's say okay has to counteract uh, i mean these four forces get generated and they balance each other actually first thing is there is a weight component which is vertical so there must be a force which is upward which should counteract that actually okay so there is a weight which is uh, balanced by lift but this lift generation mechanism also creates a drag okay there are there is i mean we will see that the reasons for creation of drag drag is a force to the back and hence even if you want to go in a constant velocity you have constant you have to constantly cancel out this this force this drag force that means you really need a force to the front actually so there are four forces essentially in a straight and level flight one is uh, weight which is uh, balanced by lift and then there is a drag which is balanced by thrust so we need to see how these uh, forces are generated actually weight is obviously it is very obvious 
okay there is a mass and then there is a gravity so because of that mg force is acting downwards so they, that is kind of obvious actually let us see the other three first thing is how do you counteract uh, that by lift how, how do you overcome uh, effect of uh, weight by lift so lift is generated by differential pressure on upper, upper and lower side of, of the wing actually if you see the wing structures there are variety of structures actually if you see there and once the aircraft starts flowing flying front actually that means you can visualize that the the fluid flows uh, backward for the you can, uh, this is one and the same things so imagine a case where your aircraft moves through the fluid or fluid moves through the through the body actually aircraft that is normally done in winter and testing also the aircraft is kept stationary where the wing the wind is blown over that actually uh, essentially what matters is relative velocity actually okay. so if you see that uh, the flow it starts from left and goes uh, to the right probably and then because of there are this flow field characteristics and all that all details will be there in aerodynamics books and things like that we will not go too much into detail the what happens here is because of the the way these wings are designed and you see some sort of something called angle of attack that means there is an angle between the velocity vector and the mean chord line okay. because of that the flow pattern is different and hence what happens is there is a low uh, there is a high pressure okay acting in the bottom then there is a low pressure acting on the top actually okay so if you see that there is a differential pressure actually okay which builds on here and if you integrate over the entire area what happens is uh, you get, you get a force section net force of what that that is uh, that is what uh, what is lift actually and remember if this angle is larger and larger this is a smaller angle this is 5 degree angle of attack and this is actually very large angle 40 degree angle of attack what happens is uh, you can get a higher lift okay and up to a limit of course okay and after that again this lift fellow starts decreasing basically so essentially what happens is if you increase this uh, this angle keeping your speed constant then you can increase the lift actually but the price to pay is your your drag also becomes more and more high okay so that's the, that 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 is the uh, drawback actually okay <coughs> so going to little bit on uh, this aerofoil theory what uh, what aerodynamic people call there will be various uh, way suppose i take a wing and and cut it through basically okay vertically then i will see something like a, some sections like this and these sections play a very very good role in generating lift actually and there are variety of ways of designing that and the different different applications actually so that means the, the bottom line is there is no ideal aerofoil actually airfoil okay depending on what application you are talking about we will probably select a airfoil that is best suitable for that application actually okay so choice of the airfoil depends on uh, flying speed wing loading construction method what technology you have and kind of flight what kind of flights you are talking about placement of the uh, i mean placement on the airplane where you want to place the wing think like that actually okay but there are variety of studies uh, including right brother themselves studies a lot of things but after that there is there is a lot of studies about that and a variety of wings are available now actually okay. now coming to the mathematics part of it uh, what is uh, what is beauty for uh, people like us in control system is this uh, this lift expression if you see this is universally same this is something given like this actually this q bar is something called dynamic pressure okay is given by half rho v square sc is something called weighted surface area of the wing okay these are typically surface area is given to a particular it's a number actually given to us from aerodynamic people for a particular uh, aircraft configuration then uh, rho is obviously atmosphere density and it's a function of height actually we'll see that how it varies and then there is a v square which is relative velocity of the air actually okay The, with respect to the vehicle so this this term is dynamic pressure okay this is surface area and this is cl which is lift coefficient now do no matter whatever aircraft you talk about whatever design of the aircraft whatever speed regime you talk about let's say let's say supersonic subsonic whatever flow pattern anything <coughs> anything uh, uh, any flying object uh, the good thing is the lift expression doesn't change actually expression is given like this where all other effects are embedded into cl okay that means uh, the model that will that will be given to us typically will contain some expressions on cl depending on the application that we talk about and that may be like given in the as a table of data and things like that as a, as a function of mach number as a function of angle of attack things like that and that can change but the entire for the overall formula will not change actually and that that helps us uh, quite a lot in in control design and all that <coughs> now coming to the dynamic pressure part of it what we saw here is the half rho v square dynamic pressure 
and this dynamic pressure is actually you can visualize the total pressure of any fluid is, is partly from static pressure and partly from dynamic pressure. <coughs> so, the static pressure is uh, rho g h okay, that uh, connect I mean this uh, <coughs> potential energy sort of thing and then there is a dynamic uh, pressure which is essentially kinetic energy content actually. Okay. So, this is what uh, plays a role in generating lift and drag essentially. Okay. So, the atmosphere density if you if you visualize I mean if you see the, the universally this remains uh, true by the way. So, if you see this at, uh, the distribution of air molecules. So, on surface of earth is they are very dense as you go up and up and up and up they are very sparse actually and that is probably because of gravitational effect. Your surface of the earth uh, the gravity is very high. So, the, you see lot of uh, air molecules concentrated on surface of earth actually. Yeah. Once it goes up and up and up, the the they are getting more and more sparse actually. So essentially, what happens? The air density decreases exponentially, right? So if you you can visualize this plot, uh, something uh, like uh, increasing uh, values being like this, and the altitude becomes more and more. Okay, your air density starts decreasing actually. Yeah. What you see here is altitude. So if you go up and up and up and up your density of the air becomes uh, low and low and low and that decrease actually happens in an exponential way. Your, your atmosphere density is roughly given by this formula with a, with a negative exponential actually. Okay. So, what happens here is the more you more height you climb the, dyna the dynamic pressure becomes more very low actually I mean lower and lower ultimately it becomes very low and you will not be able to support actually support your weight. Okay, so, that is why there will be altitude ceilings for a, for any given atmospheric flying objects and all that actually. Okay. Anyway, so, angle of attack formal definition this I told this is a free stream velocity and there is a mean chord line. If you see take that angle then that is, so that is an angle which is called angle of attack actually okay. and that plays a very critical role in, in flow pattern distribution as we saw that here. Okay, that is angle of attack the flow, flow pattern entirely depends on that quite heavily and uh, the, that angle plays a very important role in uh, in C L essentially. Okay. C L what we see is uh, as C L here okay, that will be typically a function of alpha actually. Okay. And then this is uh, this uh, one fourth of the chord line is something called uh, center of pressure actually that this is where uh, if you take dip, uh, incremental uh, pressure or incremental force and then sum it up, uh, then the moment becomes 0 out here actually. Okay. That means, the entire lift and drag gets generated out here. Okay. This is called uh, center of pressure basically. Okay. Right. Now, coming to the, the, the gross behavior of C L versus angle of attack, this is what, what happens. It starts like a fairly like a straight line, but at high region it goes and stabilizes and then it decreases actually. This is something called stall angle of attack roughly of the order of 17, 18, 20 degrees depending on airfoil actually what, what, what airfoil you are talking about. Also remember that when angle of attack is 0, you still have a positive lift actually. Okay. Only when the angle of, angle of attack is some negative value, okay, then only you will have something like lift 0 out here. Okay, so, any for positive for 0 angle of attack you still have some lift uh, generation actually. Now, coming to the drag part of it, uh, the drag is also given by very close formula instead of C L what you replace is C D. Okay. But also remember that C D is roughly a function of uh, like this uh, a function of C L in a in a quadratic way. So, C D is essentially C D 0 plus K C L square that means, it actually varies in a quadratic manner basically. Okay. So, any amount of lift that you generate this additional term keeps on building actually okay. and also remember even if you do not generate any lift even if C L is 0 still C D will be there. Okay. The drag will be will be invariably there actually. Mm -hmm. Now, there is another variety of uh, notions that are available I mean that are required in flight uh, dynamics understanding and all one of that is uh, called as Mach number. And this is a non dimensional quantity this is essentially defined as velocity of the object relative to the medium whatever your flying object velocity divided by sonic velocity that means this velocity of sound in the medium at that particular condition actually okay. so velocity of sound is also a function of height remember that velocity i mean it doesn't remain constant but if you talk about uh, 25 degree centigrade and things like that uh, the the formula is given like this okay. 
and it is largely a function of air temperature essentially and also remember temperature of air also a, a varies along with height actually that variation I have not given here it does not vary exponentially decaying manner, but it does vary with height as well actually. So, it remains like uh, at sea level at 25 degree centigrade room temperature things like that it, you can take this value as 340 meter per second actually. Now, what is the beauty of that is this particular number plays a heavy role in defining what is called a subsonic wells uh, speed or sonic speed or transonic, supersonic, hypersonic things like that because the the uh, aerodynamic behavior is a strong function of this Mach number actually. Okay. So, as long as you have a subsonic speed there will not be any shock wave generation okay. your aircraft velocity is lesser than speed of sound wherever whereas, any supersonic thing and hypersonic thing they will create shock waves as well actually. Okay. And unfortunately, it turns out that during this transonic region the aerodynamic ph phenomenon is never understood very well even now and hence the modeling becomes very inaccurate actually. Okay. These are some of the reasons why this Mach number plays a heavy amount of a role and also remember C L and C D are typically functions of Mach number as well actually. Okay. Now, C D how it how it varies with Mach number is something like this in a in a subsonic region there is a fairly constant value. Okay. Uh, essentially, what we are talking is this uh, that uh, C D 0 portion actually not K C L square term. Okay. Then it st uh, starts building up very fast. Okay, then it will again decrease and it will stabilize after some time after after uh, high speed actually okay, like about Mach number 1.52 there onwards uh, this this fellow will not change actually. Also remember that this number where it stabilizes is higher than this number that means, if you if you really want to fly a supersonic speed then your drag is going to be very high compared to subsonic thing that is why these commercial aircrafts are very successful in super in subsonic region. The moment you go to supersonic the efficiency goes down that is why this Concorde aircraft was very expensive to fly actually okay, that was a supersonic aircraft was very unsuccessful commercially basically. Okay. Now, coming to drag components you can visualize why this drag is coming there are uh, something like skin friction drag, pressure drag, induced drag uh, various other components as well. Okay. Let us see very quickly skin friction drag is essentially because of uh, surface area non smoothness actually. So, if you take a very big microscope you can see what you feel what you feel like smooth surface is not really very smooth it has some uh, I mean surface roughness because of that there will be local circulations and things like that it's essentially a friction sort of behavior actually okay that is called uh, skin friction drag. And now, form pressure drag or something it depends on the form of the object okay suppose you take uh, this vertical plate sort of thing that will where your drag will be maximum okay because the entire flow pattern is completely disturbed actually after that. Then, if you take a perfectly spherical object sort of thing, things are slightly better. Okay. Then, if you take this particular for, uh, shape, then they are still better. And if you can optimize this particular design, then it can be very, better, I mean, very good compared to all other things actually. Okay. So that because of that reason, you see this new generation cars, the expensive cars, what comes with that, they also go for some sort of aerodynamic design because once you see your speed of the car is higher and higher you essentially laid up with uh, with this pressure drag actually. So, to minimize that you see this there is a typical shape of these cars will be somewhat like this actually, somewhat uh, last two sort of thing new 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 cars actually what comes there. Now, uh, induced drag uh, is essentially we discussed about that uh, uh, as and I mean this is primarily because of this flow, flow pattern distortion uh, because of this uh, vertices that is uh, that gets created uh, I mean afterwards actually. As the angle of attack is more, this flow pattern gets the vertice, vertice generation is more. So, you get induced drag more and more. And so, this is also a function of uh, flow separation over the entire body that happens more while maneuvering actually. So, if you are flying straight and level, then the aircraft uh, structure is de designed to be optimal in that mode actually. Anyth any time that takes a turn, the entire flow field is distorted. So, you will have more and more vertice generation and things like that. So, your induced drag will be more and more actually. Okay. So, it is a strong function of your what is called as lateral acceleration actually. So, the moment you generate a lateral acceleration or normal acceleration either way then it will have a induced drag component will go more actually. So, uh, one of our control design methods we will see later in uh, I mean uh, if covered uh, uh, I will we'll see later that uh, this missile guidance application particularly uh, I mean I do not know whether I will cover that in one of our lectures or not. But one of the reasons uh, to one of the objectives there is to minimize the induced drag through an optimal way of latex generation actually. 
that is uh, that is one of the conditions that we lead to and essentially this uh, what is called as p n guidance which is very popular in missile guidance that uh, that implicitly does that anyway ok. So, those things are there actually. Now, coming to the thrust force the uh, see remember there are uh, we talked about uh, weight lift weight versus lift and drag versus thrust actually. So, this thrust generation happens through variety through a variety of ways and uh, you, can, you have to essentially use an engine to do that and uh, it can happen through a propeller to a turbo prop, turbo fan, turbo jet, ram jet, scram jet and a variety of things. It is a field by itself and we are not going to discuss too much on that. What we are what we really need is a thrust generation mechanism in uh, in, in control system design as well as uh, to a limited extent this uh, this thrust generation mechanism mechanism will also give us some sort of control force actually. We can manipulate the thrust required the magnitude as well as the direction to a limited extent. This is a thrust vectoring what we call in fighter aircrafts ok. So, these two are uh, these are possible I mean available however, uh, variety of ways of generating thrust actually. Let us very quickly see that. So, jet engines can be classified into like turbo jet, turbo prop, turbo fans things like that and this is roughly the behavior what you expect actually ok. I do not know whether this this slide is not very clear. So, uh, what is plotted out here is Mach number versus specific impulse ISP ok. And this uh, ISP ok, this is uh, uh, by definition uh, something like thrust by mass flow rate actually ok. okay. So, uh, how much mass flow is there, how much fuel you spend essentially to generate that much amount of thrust actually that is that kind of a idea there. So, if your ISP is higher and higher your engine is operating in a very good efficient manner actually. But unfortunately, what happens is if you really want to fly with Mach number higher and higher ok that is no more possible actually. So, if you see this class this class of vehicles actually what will operate on turbo fan sort of idea ok they operate on very low speed actually Mach number less than 1. So, the your efficient ISP can be kind of high actually there okay, this region actually what is all. And on the other end this is what is this rocket engines rocket engines are very inefficient their ISP is very low. However, you can fly with, with whatever Mach number you want Mach number 9, 10 whatever you want actually you can go through whatever degree of uh, speed you want actually that way. There will be something in between there are some concepts of something called ramjet, scramjet things like that. This is because of something called ramming effect that is the name ramjet comes then the supersonic combustion ramjet that is scramjet and things like that actually. So, there are essentially varied I mean the, this modern day aircrafts essentially work on either turbo fan or turbo fan with upper burners big things actually or sometimes they, they work with turbo prop as well ok and where some applications we will see actually. The propeller design, uh, propeller engines are uh, essentially old uh, ideas and they are uh, so one example is this aircraft which was used uh, by England in second world war actually because it, it was in practice actually it was operational successful. <laughs> Turbo prop engines you see the, even now there are many ATR flights that we take so short uh, short uh, duration flights uh, with uh, less or lesser number of passengers and all they are efficient in that region they are essentially operate in uh, in th in that region actually like uh, ok this uh, turbo prop variety sort of thing actually. Okay. So, ATR flights uh, do use turbo props actually this is I think many of you have seen this in airports and uh, probably many of you have flown also actually. Okay. Turbo fan engines are typically used in uh, big commercial aircrafts ok and turbo fan engines remember are lesser le le very less uh, noisy actually because the entire rotational mechanism if you see they also go inside the casing basically ok. So, that they are uh, both efficient as well as they are less noisy actually ok. So, that is uh, that is where you see these are used in uh, commercial aircrafts for, for big aircrafts basically ok. For example, A380 uses that actually. Turbo fan with afterburner, afterburner essentially remember if you see go back to this flow chart it is turbo, turbo fan with after, afterburner in this region actually whereas, only with turbo fan is that region ok. So, if you really use afterburner you can push that velocity to make number to supersonic well region actually. Okay. So, you you will uh, your ISP will be lower that means, your engine efficiency will come down, but your vehicle speed will be higher actually okay. that is where uh, your fighter aircraft for example, LCA will uh, use that actually okay. this is a light combat aircraft being designed by ADA actually. Okay. Ramjet engines are used in essentially they are used in missiles because ramjet engine operates somewhere here or very low specific impulse basically. So, the the attempts are being made to make it commercially successful as well, but because of this they are typically a concern actually ok. 
So, they are supersonic combo I mean this is something called a ram, ramming effect basically when your vehicle velocity is more than Mach number 1 you are in supersonic region you really do not need too much of uh, this uh, this complex mechanism what you see here there will be like compressor is not needed turbine is not needed like that actually. Okay. So, and then uh, but the shock wave management becomes a critical issue there actually. So, your shock wave management uh, inside shock wave goes inside the engine and you really do not uh, I mean have that much liberty here to manipulate as you want actually. So, the, there are there are critical technologies out here actually. Okay. And then still further technology boundaries towards that I mean uh, this is uh, not successful yet. However, people have only uh, test flown and demonstrated for short durations that you can even go up to make number 9 actually ok. That has been demonstrated by NASA in uh, that X 43 flight actually. This is a missile uh, so operating uh, this uh, real missile operated uh, I mean developed jointly by India and Russia. It is uh, it has been test flown and being inducted actually. So, this is so variety of missiles uh, are available which will really operate on Ramjet principle actually. This is just one of that actually. Now, coming these are all so called uh, like force balance we studied. Now, let us see very quickly what is moment balance as well. That is moment is also critical in uh, in uh, in a flying object and essentially moment is the one which gives us controlling capability of a vehicle not force actually. Force gives us propulsion characteristics and all that, but by changing the moment changing the rotational behavior we will be able to control the vehicle actually ok. That is where we see that. Now, for just a quick review what we saw there uh, force balance is weight lift drag and thrust. Also remember that there will be a side force component actually that we typically neglected that assuming that to be 0 there. So, this uh, drag is not perfectly you see the thrust is normally aligned perfectly like uh, to the nose sort of thing that is by design, but drag you do not have a choice typically drag is actually opposing to the velocity vector and velocity vector all the time need not be aligned to the vehicle th nose actually they can that can go somewhere to incline and once it happens that way ok that is the, the velocity vector sort of thing let us say ok. The velocity vector is somewhere something like this this is velocity then there will be opposing force which is there and that you can uh, resolve into two components one will come uh, that what we what we have seen as drag before ok. And then there will be a side force which will also come there. Typically, there is no mechanism to cancel the side force actually. So, in general, we do not want side force generation, okay. that is what is called as uh, like uh, turn coordination actually, coordinated turn and all that actually. We will see that. Anyway, so uh, the basic uh, moment balance is essentially three moments are there one is a rolling moment, another is pitching, and another is yawing. Okay. Essentially, this uh, this is something called body uh, axis actually. You can visualize an axis frame sitting on the center of gravity of the vehicle, where x axis is pointing to the nose, y axis is to the uh, what is called as uh, starboard or to the right side of the thing wing, and then there is uh, like uh, uh, the vertically down is something called z axis actually. So, any rotation if you can grab that axis uh, that way, ok, to, uh, pointing to the right or whatever, this is the, this this side, this side is your uh, like thumb should point out. Then your other fingers will point in that direction actually. Okay, sorry. Okay, if your thumb is in that direction, this will become in that direction actually. Okay, this is the positive rolling moment. Okay. Similarly, if you grab this axis, uh, the your thumb pointing towards that, then the other fingers wherever they point, that is called pitching action actually. Okay. We'll uh, see that one by one uh, here. But you will see that first is roll. Rolling is about uh, positive x axis. Pitch is about positive y axis and yaw is about positive z axis actually ok. So, roll pitch and yaw those two are the very critical in control system design applications as well I mean we see that actually. So, what is uh, how do you create a roll motion rolling motion suppose you really want to cancel the, the unwanted roll or you want to create a wanted rolling thing okay, you want to take a turn then you have to create a roll as well ok. Rolling and yawing are typically coupled actually if you see this this roll and yaw are typically strongly coupled whereas, pitch will be slightly decoupled from these two normally ok. In general all three are coupled, but these two are strongly coupled even in a linear setup we cannot uh, neglect the decoupling part of it, whereas this part uh, is fairly decoupled from these two actually. Okay. Now, how do you how you create a rolling motion is essentially done through create a creation of differential force through this uh, cutouts actually what is called what are called as uh, ailerons actually. So, there is a cutout here ok in the right side of the wing and there is a cutout here in the left side of the wing. Suppose your left side you turn it down 
then your angle of attack essentially goes a little bit um, higher in this side. So, that means your uh, lift C L becomes more. So, you get a larger lift force here. Whereas, you get uh, you deflect in the other side, you get a lesser lift force out here. Okay, because angle of attack, the effective angle of attack you are reducing by deflecting it up actually. By deflecting it down, you are increasing the angle of attack. So, the lift force becomes more. So, what is happening? You have a, a larger force here and a smaller force here. So, that means, there is a differential force which is not on CG, it is, is far away from CG. So, it will create some sort of a uh, some sort of moment here actually about CG. Okay. So, that effect let us see. So, the moment you, try, you deflect uh, like up and down, okay, that is that will roll like that actually this aircraft. Okay. This effect is called rolling effect. Uh, similarly, if you see the, the pitching moments, uh, how do you create a pitching action is largely through this uh, this elevators. So, they are deflected symmetrically actually either both up or both down. Once they are both up, then uh, you have a essentially there is a downward force because uh, these are differential downward force remember that they need not be the complete downward force aircraft need not come, need not go down. Okay, But there is a slight uh, downward force here, but it is far away from CG remember this length is very high. So, you get a large moment which gets generated out here actually. Okay. So, then that will uh, that will create some sort of a upward moment actually the pitching action basically that is what will happen while deflecting the elevators. Okay. And similarly, if the, the yang motion is typically controlled by rudder, okay. rudder if you generate left or right. So, there will be a side force generation essentially. So, that side force will create a uh, resulting motion actually in the in a yawing sense. By the way, this rudder is also used to nullify this uh, this uh, side force that I talked actually. If you really want to nullify this side force, then the rudder is the mechanism to do that, but it is not very effective that way. It is very effective in generating a moment because of the moment arm, but generation of uh, force is not very much capable. None of these control surfaces are very capable of generating heavy amount of force. They, they generate a small amount of force, but because the moment arm is, less, is long, it, the moment creation becomes uh, strong actually. Okay, so, this is what happens through rudder movements actually. Okay. Now, coming to that uh, uh, this, uh, this this motions what you see neat, neatly these are actually coupled motions. Okay. These are not decoupled motion let us say see that one one at a time again. Okay. You see you have uh, you have these three axes x y and z any any moment any any this uh, moment or uh, rolling action uh, about this is called uh, rolling actually. Okay. Okay, angular mo angular motion about this x axis are called rolling action. Then angular moment uh, motion angular movement along y axis is called pitching action. Okay, and angular movement along z axis is called yawing action. Okay, and for controlling the roll, we have ailerons here. Okay, okay, for controlling the pitch, you have elevators right there. Okay, for controlling the yawing, you have the rudders which is right here. Now, there are additional things as you know these are flaps and these are uh, these are uh, spoilers and these are slots and all that they are typically used uh, uh, during takeoff and landing essentially all other time they will not be used. So, they are momentarily used to either to um, uh, for example, if you spoiler you just you cannot uh, make it down it is on the surface of the wing top surface of the wing. So, you can only take it up, okay. but that is once you do that uh, what happens is there is a heavy amount of drag created actually. Okay. And these are done uh, not differentially; they are done symmetrically. Okay, you cannot do it differentially anyway. Differentially, you can do provided you deflect this one two degree and that one five degree. I mean, that's a different issue actually. But typically, both have to go up actually. They one cannot go down and one cannot go up actually. That way. So once you take both uh, both up and with equal angle, then uh, then what happens? Th this moment that you generate is counteracted by that moment. So essentially, the moment generation will not be there. But what will happen is there will be a force generation. That's additional drag will create actually. Okay. That is typically used while landing the aircraft. Once you, those of you who have flown the aircraft and seen landing carefully outside the wing, you will see that during landing, after landing, after touchdown, the, the suddenly these guys go up to create heavy amount of drag. It is essentially like a braking mechanism. Okay, so the slots, what you see there, they are deflected downwards typically to have more flow attachment so that your lift becomes more. Okay. So, that happens at uh, during uh, essentially take off uh, and landing actually. Okay. Uh, the lift becomes more, drag also becomes more, I mean that way, either way, whatever you want actually. Okay. While taking off, you want lift more, while climbing down, while touching, you want drag more actually. Okay. So, that way it is very used actually. 
flaps are also deflected vertically down that way. So, there are I mean these are uh, primary control surfaces, there are many other uh, secondary control surfaces as well. I am not going to talk uh, too much on that. For example, this elevator cutout what you see here is what you saw here, there will be a further cutout somewhere here which is only called trim tab actually. So, if you really want to fly on a trimming condition, then not only this has to go down, but that little portion at the end of that particular surface will go up actually. Okay. So, these are a variety of considerations you will see in a flight mechanics course, where this is not a flight mechanics course, we will not talk so much detail about that, but uh, many many other considerations do come into picture and there are all sort of uh, forces and moments that you see, they are all coupled actually. Okay. That means, whatever forces you see here uh, like uh, they are not uh, separated by from each other at all actually. Okay. So, that is a that is how it is a, it's a, it's a nonlinear coupled equation and there are three axes you remove that on the three axis you will get uh, like uh, three forces and three moments and all of these forces one moments are governed by Newton second law actually and each Newton second law is actually called m x double dot remove that. So, once you have double dot formulation essentially you can convert that into state space form in single dots in two differential equations. So, what essentially you have is 12 differential equations, so, 3 3 axes, 3 forces and 3 moments, 6 actually, 6 each are second order equations. That means, you will get 6 into 2, 12 equations in total actually. So, those 12 equations will be coupled with each other and th that are the equation, uh, I mean that set of equations are the one that we are going to use uh, in nonlinear control design for, for flying objects in general and aircrafts in particular actually. Okay. We will see those details a uh, little later actually. And there are variety of other things. So, suppose, suppose you really do not care about so much of details, then something called point mass equations are available. You care about let us say missile guidance over a long duration. You really do not uh, need to care as far as trajectory optimization or as far as guidance problem is concerned. You really do not care too, too much about how my aircraft or how my missile is uh, kind of uh, uh, what is the attitude of my missile, what is what angle it makes actually. Okay. As long as I go close to the target, I am okay. So, for as far as guidance problems are concerned, they are typically you will use the point mass equations, not so much detail actually. But when you come to control design in a good way, you really have to use what is called a 6 DOF equation. That is that is what I just talked about. 3 axes are there and 3 forces and 3 moments, and each are of second order equation. Okay. That essentially consists of what constitutes a 6 degree of freedom equation of motion actually that is what will be used for control design in general. All right. So, all these things we just saw that one more time let us say this is aileron for rolling control that is what will happen. Okay. These are remember these are getting deflected the, the dark ones the solid ones actually that is ailerons and this is elevator. So, these are the ones which are used okay. that is how it will be used then with that. And this is a rudder thing which will deflect if you deflect left and right that is what will happen. This is called yawing motion actually. Okay. Now, coming to the sensors also remember that as a, when you talk about automatic control of aircrafts you really require heavy amount of sensors to what it what goes on in the vehicle actually and it is a very sensor rich system rather uh, the modern day aircrafts or uh, missiles whatever you talk about uh, in launch vehicle missile. Uh, so, even satellites uh, all these are very highly sensor rich actually and in the sense uh, you can get the same information using multiple sensors as well that gives us sensor redundancy that one fails the other is still there. It also gives us uh, data fusion capability that means, if you take one measurement through one sensor and the same measurement using three or four sensors I can fuse it in a good way to get a very good uh, accurate information actually. So, all these are, uh, are are used actually. Now, come what are the typical sensors that goes in an aircraft? You can think of uh, first as an altimeter, you really need to know how what height you are flying. Okay. Then there is air data system which uh, which gives a host of information like air speed, angle of attack, Mach number, air temperature, etcetera, etcetera. Many things will come from there. Then there is a magnetometer sometimes used for heading things. Remember, uh, if you put a compass sort of things, okay, it will always point to the north actually. Okay. So, if you put a com very good compass uh, let us say on CG or something it will always point to the north. So, you will know which heading you are going actually what is your what is the direction of your vehicle that is a magnetometer. And all these have their own limitations and, uh, and advantages actually. So, depending on what application you talk about you should use uh, use the sensor information in a clever way rather. Okay. 
and what is invariably there in uh, in modern day flight of the I mean flying vehicles is something called INS system, inertial navigation system and essentially that consists of uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes, these are invariably there. Okay, accelerometers are essentially they measure translational motion of the aircraft in three axis, they will motion this uh, like uh, translational speed, translational acceleration things like that they will measure that. That means, in along x y z axis what we saw here okay, along x y z there will be a velocity component right that is those are called u v w and things like that those those kind of quantities will be measured through accelerometers. And then the rolling moment the angular motions and all they will be measured by this uh, uh, this gyroscopes okay. So, rotational motion of the aircraft in 3 axis are measured by gyroscopes typically. Then there is a another set of sensors which is called GPS global positioning system they essentially operate through satellite uh, information and all that. There are 24 satellites there up and then you acquire some 4 good satellites at any point of time around the globe that is available by the way. And then out of that uh, you collect the information of the satellites and we from at which uh, point of time they emitted that signal and using those information you calculate your own position actually in a very good way. It turns out to be highly accurate system. However, it is subjected to signal availability from the, uh, from the radar I mean, from the satellites and essentially that is controlled by US. So, there are also like parallel systems available like GPS where called GLONASS then called something are still getting developed like Gagan and things like that actually okay. they are same concepts. They operate on two frequency band also one is available throughout the world that is the civilian frequency band and the there is also a military operation band which they normally do not uh, give it to other countries unless it is a very highly friendly country probably it is available only to Israel other than US maybe other countries is not available actually. But it is a really accurate system it okay, not only it uh, measures position it can also measure ground speed as well and things like that. This is not an exhaustive list there are other sensors available as well actually something for example, star sensors they are available for uh, for attitude measurement I mean what they are uh, they can be used uh, exo atmospheric that means for satellite application they can be used actually. So, that itself is a technology by its uh, I mean in a in a huge way basically. And gyroscopes they can call mechanical gyroscope, there are fiber optic gyroscope, there are laser gyroscope, there are many things actually like that. Accelerometers uh, similar way there are and there are for UAV applications they are typically MEMS level uh, so micro electromechanical system they are manufactured that way actually. They are low cost, but uh, not that accurate systems actually ok. So, this is so what I mean is uh, a lot of information will keep coming through a variety of sensors which will be essentially processed by your in uh, by your onboard computer and to give a control command essentially ok. So, that is uh, ultimately executed through actuators, actuators will be situated now modern day uh, aircrafts actuators are situated right there where you really need that and the command as everything goes uh, through all sort of computation through uh, through uh, flight computer and essentially the signal is transmitted through a wire to this uh, this actuator system which actually uh, actuates the system it, it deflects that uh, that uh, aileron for for example ok. So, what is the required amount of computation that how much degree the how much deflection you need to give that essentially you compute using your flight dynamics using your control system technology everything. Now, ultimately you give a command to this uh, this actuator that actuator takes the command electronically through wire and then executes it uh, through some sort of like a motor uh, and all that actually either it is a hydraulic system or it is a electric electrical system as well actually ok. This is this is because all these things happens through wire not through ex extensive mechanical mechanism these are also called fly by wire uh, control system ok. Everything information is taken through a variety of sensors they are processed uh, through either uh, through low pass filter or normal filtering whatever you want to then those process information are used in flight control computer I mean control design algorithms. Ultimately, this uh, the output of the algorithm is passed back to this actuator and essentially that is executed there. So, in a nutshell putting it all together there is a flight aircraft sensors which will sense the measurements and there will be pilot command also pilot will see the outside and all that that also you can see that a huge amount of sensors that goes through pilot organs basically like eye, eye ear talk all sort of things. Then he gives a command essentially that, uh, that also comes to the control computer it goes through a variety of computation then it gives a control command which is essentially executed there. Okay. So, the entire control mechanism essentially deals with okay, this flight control computer what will deal here we will talk about algorithm development essentially okay, using the, the various variety of models the like point mass or six top or whatever how do you generate a good control algorithm which will essentially be given to the 
controller actuator essentially. So, that is our entire objective here in this particular course actually. This is where I will stop for this class. Thanks a lot.